नमस्कार एंड वेरी वॉम वेलकम टू ऑल आर व्यूवर्स यू आर वॉचिंग अस थ्रू पी एम ए विद चैनल चैनल नंबर नाइन आई एम रेणु भट्ट विद यू ऑल योर होस्ट ऑफ दिस सेशन एंड द टॉपिक फॉर दिस सेशन इज फोर्स एंड लॉज ऑफ मोशन पार्ट सेकेंड एंड दिस इज फॉर साइंस सेकेंड नाइन्थ स्टैंडर्ड स्टूडेंट्स एंड वी हैव ऑलरेडी लर्न अबाउट पार्ट वन इफ यू वॉन्ट टू वॉच दैट सेशन अगेन यू हैव टू एक्सप्लोर आर यूट्यूब चैनल दैट इज एन सी आर टी ऑफिशियल एंड फॉर दिस session we have our expert with us you are mr rahul s chatterjee assistant lecturer of physics shillong jail road boys higher secondary school shillong very warm welcome sir and dear viewers if you have any question or queries related to this particular topic force force and laws of motion part second feel free to contact us you can call us on our telephone number that is 8800440559 or you can drop a mail also on dth.class9@ciet.nic.in or let's move towards our expert and so we have already learned about part 1 we would like to know about in brief about part 1 and what you have the content for this session please tell our learners Right. Uh, that is exactly the way I have arranged the lesson. Hmm. We will have a quick recapitulation of uh, what we did in uh, part one of the lesson, and uh, then uh, I will take it on from there and uh, show the continuity of the lesson and develop the uh, this portion of the lesson. Today's lesson, of course, this will not be the end of the lesson. We will still have another part, uh, part three, coming in the future. So, students who are, um, you know. looking to forward to learning uh, this chapter from uh, these videos uh, this this particular lesson will have at least three parts in total sure sir so, so i i yeah yeah said so quickly begin the session now right okay thank you so much so um, as i was saying um, we will start off with a quick recapitulation and uh, so what is the first thing that we did the in the first class Hmm. we discussed about what a force is and finally after a lot of discussion and uh, uh, looking at what a force does and or intends to do uh, we came up with this definition for a force and we said force is that agent which changes or tends to change this part is important changes or tends to change the state of rest or the state of uniform motion of a body or its shape So these are the different things that a force can do, or at least tries to do. Uh, examples of different kinds of forces: push, pull, tension, friction, and so there are so many other kinds of forces. These are just a few examples uh, that are relevant to what you are studying. And then uh, we went on from there, and we looked at Galileo's experiment. And uh, in Galileo's experiment, where what we we discussed how Galileo um, took these curved surfaces polished highly polished curved surfaces and took a very polished sphere and dropped the sphere along this curved surface and what he noticed was each time the curved uh, the the sphere rose up on the other side to the same level same here so what the second time what he did was he extended one side but in spite of the fact that the path was longer on the second side the body still rose to the same height and he kept on increasing uh, the the asymmetry of the uh, shape of the body uh, and uh, each time what he noticed was the body would the sphere would climb up to the same height and so naturally if the second side was not made to rise up at all but made flat then the body would continue to move because its intention is to keep on moving until it rises up to that height because you are giving it a gravitational potential energy at this height that gravitational potential energy is getting converted into kinetic energy over here and that kinetic energy continues to remain as long as nothing else obstructs it or the energy is converted into any other form and uh, assuming that there is no friction the energy conversion does not take place and therefore it remains kinetic energy and if the body remains kinetic energy the body will continue to move now this was a very very important experiment because before galileo the belief was that and the understanding was that 
a body would require a constant force to be applied if it was to be constantly in motion. But today, that's not what we believe. This experiments of Galileo have clearly shown that a body in motion will continue to remain in motion in, uh, with constant velocity in a straight line, and a body at rest will continue to remain at rest. So that's the law that we uh, study today. And uh, Galileo's contribution was hugely important in uh, getting that. So to summarize, uh, we, we learned in the previous class that to move a body and to set it into motion, we need to apply a force. Or to stop a moving body, we need to apply a force. Also, to change the direction of motion of a body, we need to apply a force. And then we came to the first law of motion, and we took its statement, and we said every body continues in its state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line until and unless an externally impressed force compels it to change. And I told you externally impressed means a force that is applied from outside. To impress means to apply. Externally means from outside the system. Internal forces will never make any change on the body. Right. So this is as much as we had learned in the first lesson. Now let's take it forward from there. Now the first law of motion is a qualitative law. It only tells us, uh, you just saw the law, so it only tells us what we have to do if we want to change the motion of a body. So it tells us that we have to apply a force. If a body is at rest, you want to change that state of rest into a state of motion, you have to apply a force. If, you, if the body is already in motion, you want to change that, that motion faster or slower, or you want to change its direction, you still have to apply a force. But it does not tell you how much force to apply to bring about how much change. That is the problem with this law. So this is only a qualitative law. We want a quantitative law. We want a law which tells us how much force is to be applied to bring about how much change. Otherwise, we cannot do numericals. We cannot measure anything. And physics is all about measurements. And so we need a uh, quantitative law. But before we really go into discussing the quantitative law, there are a few other important things that we need to understand. First, let's understand uh, this concept of inertia and mass and how they're connected. So here is this um, experiment that all of you can do at home. I have a tumbler, and on this tumbler, I have a card like a postcard or you know a greetings card, you just tear off one, one part of it, place it there. And on top of the card, you place a coin. Now what we do is, we flick the card. And the moment we flick the card, the card goes flying off, and the coin would fall into the tumbler, right? The coin never goes away with the card. Now, let's, let's look at an animation of this. So there you are. We flipped the card, and the card went off flying, but the coin fell, coin fell into the tumbler. Now, if we go back, what we notice is we have set the card into motion, but the coin remains at rest. And so since there is no support, there is no object on which it was being supported, that object has moved away, it falls into the tumbler, right? Uh, okay, keep that observation aside. Now I'm going to repeat this experiment with a different coin. Let's say I put a much heavier coin now, okay? So this is the first time we do it with a light coin. And let's say, this time, let's do it with a much heavier coin. If I'm going to do it with a heavier coin, Obviously, the force required to be applied over here to flick the card will be much higher. The force required will be greater. So otherwise, everything else remains the same. You will see the card fall, fall off, the flick off, and so it will move away. And the coin will again fall into the uh, tumbler. All that will remain the same. But what we are trying to experience over here is that if this mass of the coin that is on the card if that mass is larger, then the force required to flick the card off 
is also greater. That is what we are trying to say. So force required to flick the card F2 in this case is greater, F2 is greater than F1 because mass of the coin M2 is greater than mass of the coin M1, okay? So keep this idea in, in your head. We will look at a few more animations, a few more experiments, uh, and then make some conclusions. So we have a massive body here, like a boulder. And imagine you could, you're King Kong, or you know, really, really strong, and you could move this. Of course, a large force would be required to move this heavy body from its position. So there's a heavy body, so a large force is required, and even when it moves, it moves with a very small acceleration. Whereas, oh, okay, before, the, before that. Now, the, the previous case was the body was at rest, you moved it, you applied a force. Now let us look at the body is already in motion. A heavy body is in motion. You want to stop it. Then also a large force is required, right? To move, to stop a heavy body, a very large force is required. In comparison, look at this lighter body. So a lighter body is in motion, a small force is required to stop it, okay? Now all this time, what we did was, we varied the mass of the body, and so the force required was different. This time what we're gonna do is, we keep the mass of the body fixed, and we apply different amounts of force to the body. Then what happens? So first, let's see, we apply a large force to this body, and so because it's a large force, the body goes shooting out. It's a light body, we applied a large force, and you see that the body goes shooting out. But if we apply a small force to the same body, then it moves slowly. The acceleration is much lesser in the second case. Clearly you've seen that when a large force is applied, the change in velocity is very high. That means the acceleration is high. Whereas in the second case, when a small force is applied to the same mass, a small acceleration develops, right? So, what do we conclude then? We've seen a lot of animations, a lot of experiments. So what do we conclude? Heavier objects offer larger inertia. What is this inertia? We'll see that. Quantitatively, the inertia of an object is measured by its mass. That means more the mass, greater is the inertia. And what is this inertia? Inertia is this tendency to remain doing what it is doing. Meaning to say, if it is at rest, the tendency to remain at rest, that is inertia. If it is already in motion, the tendency to remain in motion, that is inertia. Okay, so inertia so the, could be of two terms. In, is there a problem? Oh, thank you so much. So, um, quantitatively, as I was saying, the inertia of an object is measured by its mass. So, we thus relate inertia and mass in this manner. Inertia is the natural tendency of an object to resist change in its state of motion or of rest. The mass of an object is a measure of its inertia. So this is what I just mentioned a while back, that more the mass, greater is the inertia. Whether the inertia is of motion or the inertia is of rest, both ways, okay? That's what the experiments also showed that if you have a large mass at rest, you require a large force to move it. And if you have a large mass in motion, then also you require a large force to stop it, right? So mathematically, these ideas can be written this way, that the acceleration produced in a body is directly proportional to the force applied, keeping the mass constant. That's what we, have, we, we saw when we kept those two uh, bodies of the same mass, but we applied two different forces on it, right? 
So we have the acceleration is directly proportional to the force applied. Okay? And we've also seen that the acceleration produced is inversely proportional to the mass of the body. That means the acceleration produced, of course, keeping force constant, by the way, if you keep force constant. So the acceleration produced will be larger if the mass is smaller. It's like, you know what? You have a toy car and you have a real bus. You apply the same force to a toy car and a real bus. Which will go faster? Obviously the toy car. So it is inversely proportional to the mass, right? So that's what we are saying. Now, we've already seen that a heavy body that is already in motion requires a large force to stop its motion. Now, even though this is true, even though the speed of the body may be low, it's just that the mass is so heavy that you require a large force to stop it. Now consider a completely contrasting view, a contrasting situation. You have a very light body like a bullet. It's in grams, a few grams, five grams, 10 grams. It's a few grams only. But because its speed is very high, this also requires a very large force to be stopped. Now look at the two cases. First, we saw a heavy body, even though its speed is low, it requires a very large force to be stopped. And here we have a very light body, but its speed is very high, or you may say velocity is very high, and we require a very large force to stop it. Both cases, we require a large force to stop it or to bring about any change. That means, it is the combination of both that brings about any change in the motion, isn't it? Thus, the total force required to bring about any change in the motion of a body will be the product of the mass and the velocity of the body. Because both quantities are important now. And this product is called the momentum. Its symbol is P, and P then is equal to mass into velocity. Okay? Then now we can have a look at Newton's second law. We are now in a position to look at Newton's second law. And we have to develop this idea of uh, momentum and the meaning of momentum and the importance of the measure of momentum of a body. Because as you will see just now, when we uh, when I show you the statement of, the, of Newton's second law, you will see everything over there is mentioned in terms of momentum. It says that the rate of change of momentum of an object is proportional to the applied unbalanced force in the direction of force. Notice that it is the rate of change of momentum. In the first law we said that to bring about any change in the motion of the body, we have to apply a force. And now there is no mention of motion. That motion has converted into momentum. Because to bring about any change in the motion, it is really the product of mass and velocity which become important. Both quantities are important. And which is why we have to talk about the momentum of the body. So it says, the rate of change of momentum of an object is proportional to the applied unbalanced force in the direction of force. So if you apply a force in a particular direction, the change in momentum will happen in that direction. That's the meaning. OK, so mathematically, what does it mean? So let's consider we have a body of mass m, and it's moving along a straight line and its initial velocity is u, let's say. And we apply a force on it for a certain time t, some force f for a certain time t. Now, if we are going to apply a force on a body in the direction of motion, then naturally its velocity is going to increase, right? So its velocity increases from u to v. So then we can calculate its initial momentum. So initial momentum is mass into initial velocity, and final momentum is mass into final velocity. So we can easily calculate what is the change in momentum. So the change in momentum is P2 minus P1. 
And that I can write as m into v minus m into u because the final momentum is mass into final velocity and initial momentum is mass into initial velocity, right? So that is the change in momentum. Or I can take the mass common assuming that the mass remains constant during this process of change in velocity, okay? Then I can take the mass common out and then I can measure the rate of change of momentum because that's what the statement says, that the rate of change of momentum is proportional to the force applied. So the rate of change of momentum is change in momentum divided by the time during which this change took place, okay? And then this should be equal to the force then by the statement of the second law. So the force applied F then is proportional to mass into change in velocity over time. But do you recognize this quantity, M into V minus, uh, so rather just V minus U by T? What is V minus U? V minus U is a change in velocity and change in velocity by time is rate of change of velocity. So what is rate of change of velocity? That is acceleration, right? So we will replace this V minus U by T by A, acceleration. But before that, what we'll do is we will convert this proportionality sign into an equality sign by introducing a constant. So we've introduced this constant K and we've converted the proportionality into an equality, okay? Now we can replace this V minus U by T by A, okay? So we can then write that F is equal to K times M times A, okay? Because A is V minus U by T, right? So now the question is, what is the value of K? Unless we know the value of K, we cannot use this formula. And it's always convenient if we can choose our definitions or systems of units in such a way that the constant of proportionality becomes equal to one. Sir, here, to sir here I want to tell you that we have left with two more minutes only. Right, I'm, I'm done also. Thank you so much. So the, F, the, the unit of F is so chosen that K becomes equal to one. And so how do we choose F? We say that F is that amount of force that produces an acceleration of one meter per second squared in an object of mass one kilogram. So if we just put it back into the equation, then we have F is equal to one is equal to K into mass is one into uh, acceleration is one meter per second squared. So ultimately, the right hand side is just K into one, left hand side is one, so ultimately K becomes equal to one. And therefore, we can write F is equal to MA. Now remember, we made an assumption that over here the mass remains constant. So only in the situations where mass remains constant, we can use this formula, okay? And in the next class then, we will take it up from this point uh, and uh, we will look at what happens if we can transfer the time to the other side and write the equation as f into t equal to m into v minus u. And then we will see all the things that open up from there and all the different uh, explanations that we can do from taking the equation in this form. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Rahul S. Chatterjee, for your detailed information on force law and laws of motion part second i'm quite sure our student would be beneficial for this uh, from uh, for this session uh, thank you so much for joining with us sir thank you so much my pleasure and dear viewers it's time for us to take a uh, small break you don't need to go anywhere else stay with us on pm avidya channels namaskar